Hello community! Whenever there are some publications by some very specific people, I read their publication. And when two of those people publish together, like for example here Matei and James, you can bet they're gonna read their publication. Now, Matteo is also the CTO of Databricks, a great company, Professor Stanford University, James, Microsoft, Harvard, Stanford. And they have now, together with Ling Jiao Zhen, a new publication, Frugal GPT. But the title is not really that important. But the topic is amazing for a Stanford publication. How to reduce cost and improve the performance of large language models. Now, maybe the title should be well, Reducing the Price for Customers and Improving the Performance for Customer, but whatever. So, what can we learn from this publication? Now, if you are a small business in the United States of America and you use GPT-4 to support your customer service, your prices are about $21,000 a month. Now, those large language models run in this cloud supercomputer center and they have substantial energy impact and there is a substantial environmental impact of those cloud compute centers. So the question is, how can we reduce all the resources that we need to run those LLMs in the compute center? And let's look at a financial perspective. Now, for the cloud computer center, we have or even for the price segment, we have the cost from the prompt. Now, you know this is proportional to the length of the input prompt to GPT-4, for example. We have here the price is based on the number of tokens that constitute in total a prompt. Now, this is the input, but of course, if the answer comes back from the system, the generation cost, is of course proportional to the generation length. If you have a lengthy answer, you pay for every segment of this answer. And of course, you have sometimes a fixed cost attribution per query. Those are if you think about the overhead structure. Now, in this study, they compared the cost, the price associated with 12 different commercial LLMs from different mainstream providers. But this is not the important part. What is really important that they had an idea doing this. And they came up with an idea they called Frugal GPT. Now, they want to reduce for us, for the user, for the developer, for the application, the inference cost to run our queries on these cloud machines. And they say they looked in particular at three different elements. The prompt adaptation we have here, then the LLM approximation, and the LLM cascading. I will explain all three in detail to you. Now, they said by optimizing over a selection of different LLM APIs, like for example, GPT-J, ChatGPT, GPT-3, GPT-4, GPT-3.5, and whatever, as well as different prompting strategies, such as zero shot, few shot, chain of thought, we can achieve substantial efficiency gains. And for example, on one specific news data set, when they trained and they, they built and to train frugal GPT, they found out that they can reduce the inference cost of running your queries by 98%. And this is extreme. And they say it also while exceeding the performance of the best LLM GPT-4. So your quality increases and your costs go down by 98%. How is this possible? Can we use it? And the good answer is yes. So let's look at first, I just show you here, as I told you, prompt adaptation, LLM approximation, and LLM cascade. What is it? How we use it? Prompt adaptation. Now, a logic approach to reduce the cost is now the first cost element. When we use an LLM API, and this involves decreasing the prompt size, the length of the prompt, a process they refer, the authors refer, we, as a prompt adaptation. Now you have here two subcategories, prompt selection. This is rather than a prop employing a prompt containing numerous examples. You remember with in-context learning ICL prompts, we give in front of some learning examples for the GPT-4 system. We say, this is how you, we want that you structure your answer. 
So we demonstrate how to perform the task. And they say one, one way to save price here is a smaller subset of examples in the prompt. This has consequences, of course, for the quality, and I will show you in two minutes. Now, the result, smaller prompt length and subsequently lower costs, lower price point for you. Now, an intriguing challenge of prompt selection now lies here in determining which examples to maintain for the queries without compromising the performance. And there we have a beautiful guideline. The other one is here the query concatenation, that you have several queries must be concatenated into a single query, and the prompt must explicitly request here to process multiple queries at the same time, so you do have some benefit if you squeeze together several queries that, are, that are, have a common team. Now, the second one is LLM approximation. This is now very easy, very simple to understand. You have an external cache. So it's called completion cache, beautiful. The fundamental idea involves storing the response from GPT-4 locally on our notebook, in a cache, in a database, wherever you are. So whenever submitting a query to an LLM, you have you record the query and you record the answer you get back from GPT-4. Now, whenever you process a new query, we just verify here at the very first step if a similar query has already been previously answered by GPT-4. And if so, we do not have to go to GPT-4, but we go to our database and we say, hey, we have an answer and we retrieve this from our cache, wherever the cache is. So if a numerous user set searches for similar keywords at the same time, within five seconds, you have now the completion case cache answering all the queries, either by invoking the LLM only once, if we have no idea what is the answer, or if we already have an answer from the LLM from about two days ago, well, then it is easy. We do not have, we do not use here our GPT-4 system at all. Now, if you think you have a small enterprise and every, I don't know, every five seconds, you have 10 complaints from your customer and they all have more or less the same problem and you can give them all the same answer. So you see that a cache here, a completion cache in front of is really something that decreases your cost if you are a small business. Now, another example is here interesting, is you fine tune another model with the query answer responses. <laughs> Why do you do this? Now think about GPT-4. GPT-4 has everything in it. Literature, songs, politics, news, art, drawings, physics, mathematics, chemistry, everything. But let's say you are a small enterprise and you are only specialized in shoes. Why should you know your GPT-4 system about French Lyric? You just want to have answers about your shoes in your company. So you get it. You extract the important portion out of GPT-4 you fill it in, in a, here in a, in a smaller AI model and you use the smaller local AI model. Beautiful. This is all there is. Cost savings, fine tune a smaller and more affordable AI model. Beautiful. So what they did, what they really implemented was a third version, the LLM cascade. So what is it? It is simple that they have now different combination of LLMs. Let's say GPT-3, this is the cheapest GPT system with theirs. Then we have Jet GPT. This is the free version, our GPT-3.5 Turbo. And then we have, of course, the full-fledged GPT-4. So instead of sending all queries to GPT-4, that is the most expensive, they say, hey, why do we not start with GPT-3? Have a look if the answers are good enough for our customer service desk, because GPT-3 is so much cheaper than GPT-4. And you see where this goes. And they found it in their experiments, and I'll show you in a minute, so they can save up to 98% of the inference cost 
of the best individual LLM API for them it is GPT-4 while matching the performance. So beautiful. If you are now surprised that Stanford Frugal GPT uses here three different AIs, don't be, because about three weeks ago, almost a month ago, I did this video, upgrade your vector database to an AI and go multi-AI. Now, a month later, we have the publication from Stanford University where they tell us, hey, use three different AIs instead of vector databases or whatever else. Because if you look at the cost, this is really an attractive version. So all my subscribers who followed my advice about a month ago, I think to update vector database to an AI, go multi-AI, it was not such a bad advice. Now, why from those three versions they have chosen the third version? Oh, sorry. In my last video, pure coincidence, I was talking about instruction fine-tuning and in-context learning of LLMs. And I had this example here. This is the input prompt, if you want. So why? Where are we? Number one. The prompt adaptation. Now we play with prompt selection, query concatenation. We do here prompt engineering, prompt design, in-context learning, whatever you want to call it, this is where we are working now. So why not use the first one? Now, I showed you in this video, if you have here an instruction, an exemplar, and a label, and another instruction, example, and a label, and even more examples here in your prompt, and then you have your evaluation and you expect here, given you have here the instruction for GPT-4, GPT how you expect your answer to be, this is it. And then I went with those three different use cases where I said, hey, if we do have a relevant label, but no instruction, or vice versa, we do have instruction, but no relevant label, to the worst case, we have no instruction at all in our data set and we have no relevant label and we are going with symbolic fine-tuning of our LLM. And if you have seen the video, you know that the outcome was that uh, we had a look at Palm 540 billion free parameter model. And you see here, check, check is here on the two blue. Check, no, is here exactly this. This is number three and this is number four. So for the Flan Palm 550 bar, you saw 82%, 77%, 70% accuracy, and 58% accuracy. So this means if you have instruction and if you have relevant labels for your specific prompt design with 82 points of whatever, in relation to the other three additional options, this is the best result. And if you use here symbol tuning in addition, you can increase your performance from 82 to 84 points, whatever we measure here. And you see, if you have neither here an instruction nor a relevant label that has a semantic relevance to the example, our performance goes down. Beautiful. But I also showed you in this video that this the number of exemplars per class. If this is one prompt you give to GPT-4, how many examples should you provide? One, two, three, four, five, six, sixteen? Where is their performance? And look, the dark line here, the top line here is the dark line. This is Flan Palm 540 billion trainable parameter. And you see, on the x-axis, we have the exemplars per class. So if we have two examples, so example one and two, and this is it. We do not give, we do not provide more. Then the performance of this system is, let's say, well, fifty-seven percent accuracy. If we just double the number of examples, one, two, three, four, we increase to almost I don't know seventy-eight percent. So we jump ten percentage points just providing two more examples in the prompt structure. If you go to eight, we increase. And if you have 16 examples, and now we have with the new GPT-4 input length, we can go up to 32K token length. So 16 examples should be no problem at all. We come close to 90% accuracy 
Yeah, of course, with the, fl with the Flan Palm 540B model. But you see, even if we have here, look at the 8 billion parameter trainable model, here the, the lowest line, you see we have an increase from 50-50 more or less. This is at 42.4%. And it, it goes up, it, not, not so strong, but it goes up to almost 60% accuracy just by providing more examples per class. Now, this means, of course, the more exemplars per clause that uh, the prompt, the length of the prompt increases. So, if we now look at the first solution they provide, prompt adaptation. This means shortening the length of the input prompt to GPT-4. You see, if you go from eight examples per class just to four examples per class, so reduce the length, the token length, you also decrease the accuracy of your response. So I would not recommend limiting the prompt adaptation to shorter length because this is in direct relation to the qualitative accuracy performance of your LLM. So they decided not to go with prompt adaptation. Now, two, this external cache is a similar solution to an advanced solution that is LM Cascade. Now, let's focus now on LM Cascade. What is it? Now, the main idea of frugal GPT, as they call it, is a data adaptive large language model selection if we work with three different LLMs. Beautiful. So, what we have? We have here two elements. We have a generation scoring function, I will show you in a second, and we have simply an LLM router. So that routes, okay, you go to the first LLM that is the cheapest, or if it's not good enough, you go to the second LLM, the second cheapest, or if this is on, so it's also not good enough, you go to the most expensive LLM, and this is simply the task of the router. Yes, yes, yes. The remaining are queried only if the previous API generations are deemed insufficient reliable. Beautiful. So the query cost now is significantly reduced if the first few APIs, like say GPT-3 or GPT-3.5, are less expensive and already produce a good enough result. Let's say for your customer support. So. You see, easy, we have, for example, a data set. And then we just have with LLM cascading, you cascade to the cheapest one, to the second cheapest. And if all of those does not work and the answer is not good enough, you go to GPT-4, where you really have to pay quite a lot to open AI. So, and now you might ask, hey, this score, this threshold score, who calculates the score and how is the system trained? Good that you ask. So this scoring function that you say, how good is, is the quality of my answer that I get back from the GPT system. Now, at first, you're not going to believe it. It can be a very simple regression model. And what is the simplest regression model? Of course, it is an AI, a transformer. And yes, you have here the, the time of multi-AI. So you better get used to multi-AI systems. But here it is really easy. This just learns here whether a generation is a generation is correct from the query and the generated answer. So you have here a training process and you train here a simple regression model. Now the simplest regression model you can think of is distilled BERT, a BERT model. So this is the encoder stack of our transformer architecture. And you can even use a distilled version, a simpler, smaller version. So distilled bird is really the minimum requirement. So we have an AI for the switching between our models. Now, case study, we use here a, spe a specific data set of headlines. The budget is $6. This is all, which is one fifth here of the cost. They employ now here this distilled BERT tailored to regression, to simple regression model as our scoring function. The system learns on a training data set, and then you can use it like any other LLM operational. Now, of course, I have, I don't know, 10 videos on BERT alone on how to fine tune and optimize BERT. 
It is important to note that Distilled Bird is smaller and less expensive. You can even run it locally on a Windows machine. So much less expensive than any other LLM we have here. So we have now a data set, headlines or financial news or whatever we have. Cheapest model, good enough, beautiful. This is the answer. It's not good enough. Let me go to the next one. Is it below this core? Yes or no? If not, we go to GPT-4. Otherwise, this is already the answer. This is the main idea of Frugal. So you see, you have no external cache. You have no external vector store. You have no external, I don't know. You just use three AIs, LLMs, GPT system. Now, you might say, hey, why do I not go to a database or whatever, or any other computation? Because you need here this human language capability. And even if it's just a reduced version, like GPT-3 or GPT-J, you need here this human touch conversation. So this is it. Yeah, the result is, for example, if you only use GPT-4 from the very first to the very end, you have overall in this data set accuracy of 0.857, and it costs you with uh, GPT-4 is open AI. This costs you $33. And if you use the frugal GPT system, you increase your accuracy, and I'll show you why. And the cost are instead of $33 down to $6. Interesting. So why, why is happening that even the accuracy goes up? Now, even GPT-4, sometimes GPT-4 makes a mistake, but Frugal learns to use the correct answer and it even goes back an answer, let's say to J1 or GPT-J, the system before GPT-4, and it uses this one. It is maybe not as qualitative, but if GPT-4 makes a mistake, it is at least to 90% the correct answer. So you can reduce the cost, and sometimes even improve the accuracy by 1.5%, even compared to GPT-4. This is amazing. And this is a study by Stanford University. So what we learned, we learned that multi-I system that include various price points and different performance level of those singular AIs in this multi-AI cluster that we address, combined with a scoring function. And this scoring function could be, as I showed you, a trained bird transformer, can provide significant cost savings for us, the user, the developer, the app developer. And I think this is a beautiful idea. Not only go to the most expensive machine and pay always the highest price, even if your standard query might be answerable with a GPT-3 system. And you have an idea and you say, hey, if I have here this cascade of LLMs, what happens if I go down, further down, further down in the quality? What happens when we use lower and lower quality GPT systems? And then maybe we even fall under the multi-head self-attention threshold of our current transformer structure that is patented by Google. What happens if we, how, how deep can we go in our low quality assessment? And the answer is, is really fascinating. I thought about this yesterday. So in this theoretical case that we do not deploy GPT-4 systems, not even GPT-3 systems, but we use cheaper and faster variants of those systems, then maybe we would have to provide additional semantic linguistic information to our AI system when we query this low performance system. And this is of course, because if you go lower and lower, sometimes the self-attention mechanism or if even the multi-query attention mechanism that we have in StarCoder will break. It will, the model will be not good enough. So, although it sounds absurd, you might say, but in this case, in this theoretical case, we would have to define, for example, in the sentences, we have to go back two years. We have to define the subject of the sentence. We have to define the object of the sentence. Maybe we have to define the verb. Maybe we have to define the time that we use. And ideally, 
we would fall back to a structured data format to remember SQL databases, Oracle databases. And maybe we would have to use a template where we have some induced instruction code sequences from this template. And what would be the benefit and what would be the pro and con of this system? Now, on the one hand, it would, for the cloud service provider, it would be a system that is much cheaper, much faster, less energy, less pollution of the environment, and again, much cheaper to run. But of course, on the other side, since we now have to provide additional information to this AI system, because it is not as advanced as a GPT-4 system, we have to provide here more information. This would mean that the length of the input prompt would increase because we have to provide this additional information, you know? So let's say in this hypothetical case that we use here an AI like Bing Chat. Um, if you know, this is a for-profit corporation. So how would it look like? It would look like this code here. It would say import guidance, 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 uh, go on LLM, open AI text, WJ03. And then you define your few shot example here in a specific template language. You would say the input is, I wrote about Shakespeare. And then you have entities, the entity is I, the time is present, the entity is Shakespeare, the time is the 16th century. Uh, and, and you do the work for the AI to make it really clear to this low performer AI, uh, who is the entities, what is the time, what is the subject, what is the object. You see here, what is the expected answer. So whenever you give this few short examples, you have a lot of text. So the text length, the token length of your prompt would increase significantly, which would mean absolutely contra to what I just showed you from Stanford that I told you we have to decrease the length of the prompt to be cheaper. This would lead to increase in the price that you have to pay. And then you define a guidance program and you have give a sentence, tell me where it contains, yes, yes, yes. And of course you have further instruction because this is a template language and you have here a, a data structured input. And so you see if somebody would come up with this, uh, okay. Uh, hey, good news, May 18, Microsoft releases guidance, a uh, next generation language for prompt programming. And you see, you can always see things from a lot of perspective, from a lot of different perspectives. And maybe my view was not the right view. Because if I follow here this publication, Microsoft recently introduced a groundbreaking language called Guidance, revolutionizing the landscape of prompt programming. With this innovative language, developers now have the power to generate natural language responses in various format, creating simple yet sophisticated rules. Maybe this marketing ad from Microsoft is the real perspective. You should see this. So as always, it is up to you how you evaluate this. You have now quite some data. And it is up to you as a customer, as a user, since AI becomes now a business. It is about cost against performance. And it is for you to decide where to buy. I hope this video was informative and I see you in my next one.